Is somebody not back yet? Please raise your hand. <laughs> He's not back yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll just continue on. Um, now there's a question about, you know, how does this relate to sampling? Right? And if you, so I, and I should stand at the right place here. Um, if you look at these grids here, I mean, what you have here and here is basically just a subsample of a regular grid. Now, well, you could say, well, in fact, what we could do, we could actually just take a random subsample, right? So if, for example, we wanted to compute an integral in high dimensions of a function, you know, defined on, on, on a regular grid, say, what we do, we, we take a random sample of grid points, right? And take the average of the function on those grid points. Um, and that's, you know, that's the so-called Monte Carlo method to, com to approximate integrals. I know it's a reasonable method. It gives you a 1 over square root of the number of points, approximation order. Uh, maybe with some tricks you might get a bit better. These here, these things here you could actually use for integration as well. So you could base an integration scheme on these grid points. And in fact, this, this has been done as well. So the difference between this here and the Monte Carlo method of the random sampling is that here, of course, you know, we do a, a regular sampling. And what we utilize here to get higher orders of approximation, because that's basically what we get here with the same number of points, we can get higher order of approximations. We use the smoothness of our functions. Whereas, you know, the smoothness of the function doesn't really come in in a big way in, in you know, at least in very standard, simple Monte Carlo methods. Here, the smoothness of the function is absolutely essential. So if we don't have those smoothness assumptions, you know, we won't get as good approximation orders. I will not go into these smoothness assumptions. They're slightly tricky, but there's something like uh, uh, C2 twice continuously differentiable in all your variables, something like that. So not, not uh, unreasonable smooth assumptions. So this is just about the uh, connection to sampling. But what we want to do is we want to look at functions here which are approximated by spaces where we have, which are defined by the function values on these grid points. And what do we want to do? Remember, we want to solve this penalized least squares problem, right? This is our, our learning problem. And if we put our basis functions in here, so if we put this here into here, we get something which looks like this. So these are our coefficients. Sorry, I call these x. Uh, maybe I should call them eta, corresponding to the, the new terminology which I learned now, you know. Um, the statisticians you know, sometimes use beta. Right, so they put an extra b in front of the eta, I guess. Um, and here we have our penalty term, you know, which corresponds to the to the our uh, Hilbert space norm. Now, we have a, a quadratic minimization problem in a finite dimensional space, and we can then write that as a the minimum has to satisfy these so-called normal equations. Right? I think most of you would recognize A transpose A, right? And here we have you know, a penalty term here, which comes from, from this here and the right-hand side here. So basically what we have to solve now is this system of equation. So how is this any different from what we had, the system we had for our kernels? Right? Remember the the linear system of equations we had for our kernels often looks like this here. So we have our k matrix of the, the, the values of our kernel functions plus alpha times identity times our eta equals 
y, right? So that's the equations we have to solve you know, in, the, in the current situation. The difference is that, first of all, the matrix we have here, so this, mat this is the matrix of our system of equations. This is under our control. This depends on the size of our approximation space. And if we're using sparse grids, now we actually have some sort of control over that size. So it can be much smaller than the matrix here, which, where the size of the matrix here is, is equal to the number of data points. So you know, we have a, we have a, a, a saving here. Also, the, what about the data? There's another interesting point here. How does the data come in? Well, the, each row here of our matrix A, the matrix A corresponds to function evaluations. Right? They correspond to these terms here. So one row corresponds to one term in here. So we have our matrix A has lots of rows, n rows. But of course what we can do, we can first compute this matrix, we can assemble this matrix here first and before we solve it. So during the solution process, we don't need to go through our data anymore. We just assemble our matrices and then solve our systems. Whereas here, this matrix here depends on our data points. So you know, we have to, if we have an iterative method, we have to go through all our data every time. Also the right hand side, you know, we have our, our data points here. Here, we can assemble this here first and uh, and you know, and, and we not, don't need to iterate if we have an iterative method through our data points. So you know, if we have a gigabyte data set, a huge data set, right? It's very costly to go through these data. I think this is an advantage. We don't need to go through our secondary store all the time if uh, if our data doesn't fit into main memory. I mean, this is, I guess, becoming more more and more unlikely. But you know, you, I think many of you would encounter very large data sets which still would not fit into, into uh, uh, main memory, and certainly not in your L2 cache. So, so this is an issue. So you have smaller systems which, are, which you know, don't depend directly on your data. And then we, you know, we could use, uh, I mean, we have here positive definite linear systems as uh, before, so we can use you know, similar methods to, to solve these. <coughs> Ah, also about the structure. Often what we see is that the matrices have this type of structure so that the diagonal blocks they have this block structure. And each block corresponds to one of those regular grids. Remember our sparse grid is a union of regular grids. Right? And so on a regular grid we know to ha how to solve these least squares problems. You know that's a standard finite element uh, penalized smoothing uh, problem. Has anyone uh, encountered a penalized least squares fit using finite elements? Anyone seen that at all? No? No? So I mean this is, this is done, uh, this has been done quite regularly and you, you know it's a standard, standard problem but the thing is that your, your, your matrices in that case they have a special sparse structure if you go to the off-diagonal blocks, you get, uh, you get dense structures. So it's a bit more tricky. OK, so now I'll look at different ways of, of looking at these equations. So we start, with, we start with these here. So I hope you're all happy with these equations here. And we look at sort of variants of this. So now let's say, let's introduce this which we call f again, is a times x. So what is this? This is just the prediction of our function values relating to our data points. Right, so I think that's what, and Bering will correct me if I'm wrong, some statisticians call a, a smooth. Right? And so the mapping which takes your data and maps it onto this f would be a, a smoother. Right? And so uh, now if you introduce that, then we can say, if we look at our 
uh, these equations here, we see that we have a times x here, so, we are, so that's our f. Right? So we'll introduce that in our equations here. We have a times a transpose f, which corresponds to the a transpose ax. So, th so this is the original equation here, as we have before. And then uh, the second equation I put in here is just the definition of our f. Right, you know, nothing magic. A simple augmentation. So the, uh, I mean, that's what, even in the, in the classical theory of uh, the solution of least squares, you look at augmented linear systems. And that's a similar thing here. Has anyone heard of augmented linear systems for the least squares problem? So the augmented linear systems is the system of equations which you can write down as a linear system of equations for your unknowns plus your residuals. So you, make, you augment your vector of unknowns by the vector of residuals, and you get a linear system of equations for that. And that's something which you do here. That's a, sort of a, a traditional uh, tool which is used in the solution of these things. But the interesting thing now here is that actually you, you say, well, actually this x, these are our parameters or our etos. We're not really interested in those. Maybe we're just interested in our f's, right, in our smooth values. And so we can say, okay, this here is, is positive definite. This corresponds to our uh, scalar product in our Hilbert space. So we solve for that, right? And we, we get the so-called sure complement. Anyone heard of a sure complement? Yes, okay, so Vichy has heard of sure complements. Uh, sure complements, they relate to Gaussian elimination. Everyone has heard of Gaussian elimination. I'm not going to ask about Gaussian elimination. Thank you. So everyone has heard about Gaussian elimination. So if you take Gaussian elimination and you eliminate the first, the second, the third, the fourth, and so on, maybe up to the 15th unknown, if you eliminate all those, you get the linear system of equations for the remainder of all the unknowns, right? And everyone knows how to do that. That's basic Gaussian elimination. The matrix of that system for the remaining unknowns is called the Schur complement. So it's a very simple concept. You know, it's a, I mean, all these mathematicians, they have to tack their names to something, I guess. You know, so so uh, that's why they have these names. But anyway, so this is, a, this is a basically a, a Schur complement. We sort of eliminate this, these variables x, and then we get a system of equations for f, for our f's. And then we solve this, and we can write that formula as f equals s times y, and this is this, uh, this gives us f times s times y, and s is just this here. So this is the, the smooth, right? This is the, or the smoother. It's a, a matrix which we get from our problem to compute from our data points we compute the smooth data points. It's our filter, basically. Right? In filtering, this is the filter. This is a, a low-pass filter, if you want. This is the matrix for our low-pass filter. And, you know, I made some comments on how to solve these things. Now you could say, oh, interesting, but how does this relate to our kernel? Okay, so what we do, we remember that what is, what is the kernel? So the kernel here in our space corresponds to this here. So what does this mean? So what is the kernel? The kernel basically is our Green's function. Corresponds to our Green's function. That's what we saw earlier. So it corresponds to the solution of our problem, uh, of a variational problem relating to the penalty only. And then we evaluate that on our data points. And that's exactly what we do here. So we solve the thing with our penalty term and evaluate on our data points from the left and from the right. So we get a matrix which has the values at the data points x1 to xn. And this is exactly the, the kernel in our approximation space. And now how does this kernel phi, this matrix, kernel matrix, relate to our smoother? Right, so we remember uh, So now let's see here. Um, 
Ah, oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, this, yeah, sorry. This equation we don't remember. This one we didn't have yet. But this one down here we remember, right? So this is the equation for, the, for our coefficients with respect to our kernel basis functions, right? So this equation we had before. So this is just this equation uh, here, uh, this one here, for our, for our kernel. So we have phi c equals uh, f, because this is the evaluation of our kernel and our data points gives us our smooth, right? That is how, how c was defined. And so if we combine that, this here, uh, we get, uh, with what we had before, we get this relationship between our kernel and our smooth. And so you could say, well, you know, very strange, Mark, is the, on the right-hand side, you have a symmetric matrix, right? The kernel is a symmetric matrix. Sorry, and I shouldn't stand over here. The, the kernel is a symmetric matrix, and here we have a product of some matrices. How can this be symmetric? Is it? A product of two symmetric matrices is in general not symmetric, right? However, yes, I mean, somebody have a solution to that? Well, if you look at any function of a symmetric matrix, any analytic function, is always, it's always a symmetric matrix. Right, so, and here we have a function of a symmetric matrix. And uh, just, you know, to do a little bit uh, uh, linear algebra to show this, that this is really true. So I'll, I'll write this down here. Or maybe I'll, I'll use the board over here. So this is a bit of linear algebra. We have a symmetric uh, function, which, a symmetric matrix, which is S. And we look at this F of S. What is this S? So we know, and I forgot, now I think, well, certainly somebody has mentioned I think maybe Sam has mentioned it uh, in the early part of your, the course, or the last week, and, and many of you would know this, that the symmetric matrix can actually be diagonalized with orthogonal matrices Q, so that there are Q2 times, a Q transpose times a diagonal matrix lambda times Q. So symmetric matrix can be diagonalized. Another pen. And the yes, yes, so the thing is that we, we're sort of running short of pens. I'll try this one here. The thin, the thin ones are better. Okay, so uh, let's use this. Uh, can you see this? No? Can, can you see that from the back? Can you see that? Okay, so S equals Q transpose lambda Q, right? Where the Qs are so called orthogonal matrices. Yeah, I think Sam definitely talked about this, right? And he talked about simultaneous uh, diagonalization as well. So for symmetric matrix, we can do this here. And a function of S equals, is nothing else, and this is very easy to see, a function of the lambda times Q. You know, for example, you know, if you take the square of S with itself, you'll see that you know, because Q times Q transpose is the identity, that drops out, you get the lambda squared there. And you get that for quite general functions here as well. Now this here is an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal matrix, right, times the inverse of this orthogonal matrix, symmetric matrix, right, okay. So here you are. This here has to be a symmetric matrix on the other side too. Just a reminder of some basic uh, linear algebra. Okay, so uh, now if we get sparse grids, yeah, we still have time for some sparse grids. Remember that our sparse grid spaces, our generalized sparse grid spaces are the ones 
which relate to the ordinary grids, the regular grids, in the sense that you know, the sparse grids are the unions of the ordinary grids, and the approximation spaces are sums of functions defined over uh, regular grids. So any sparse grid function, how you evaluate that, you, you compute it on all the, 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 the function values on all your regular grids, and just sum that up. Uh, that's what, what I mean by sum. So what happens here is, uh, in this case, we get uh, you know, our functions here, are sums of functions on regular grids. And now what I do is, I, I, uh, now of course the problem is that these grids are not independent. You know, the grids will intersect. In particular, the constant function will be an element of any grid function space we're looking at here. Right? And so, uh, so there's a slight difficulty here. So, so we have this non-uniqueness. What I'll assume, however, is that we have our penalty terms such that these spaces are separated. So that's maybe a, sort of a bit of a, a lousy trick, if you, if you want. However, if you do that, what you get is that your, your, your partial kernels, they look like this here. You know, remember the, the formula for our kernel matrix we had before is A times this Green's function times A transpose. These are the point evaluation matrices. This is our Green's function, so we get you know, the, the kernel here. And uh, uh, we get, uh, as before again, we get our, our components uh, uh, like, like this here. And the equations we get, um, <coughs> sorry, so, so here, here you have to be a little bit careful. If you look at the variational problem, these are the equations you get. Now the, the key point here is that we have our f in here. So this is where all the grids are connected to each other. So if we, are, if we had an f phi here, right, then we would get a sort of uh, just the, the, the problems for the grids which are disconnected. Well, anyway, I think I'm not going to uh, labor on this point too much, but what you get at the end is a linear system of equations which looks like this here for our component functions and our smooth here. Now, is this known by statisticians? I'm not going to claim that they don't know it, but, but I wonder, you know, has anyone seen this? And this is a very nice matrix. It's an arrow, it has an arrow shape, right? Well, in fact, it's certainly very closely related to something which statisticians know very well, which is not here yet, but on the, on the next page. So uh, what we do here, in the first step, we eliminate our f from those equations, then we get a more dense linear system of equations for our components. And uh, now the thing is, the, what the statisticians know is this here. So this is a different view. So instead of using the kernels, you could actually use this connection between our kernels and our smoothest to get this system of equations of here, this here. And if you eliminate the f, you get this here. And this is a system of equations which is really very known and, for example, discussed in the book by uh, Hasty and Tipshirani on generalized additive models. But you can see, I think the interesting thing is here, that there is actually a corresponding equation, uh, this here, using the uh, kernel matrices instead of the smooth matrices. Uh, where did I go? Now I'm going backwards again. Huh? Okay, so uh, now you say, okay, this is a large system of equations. These matrices here, they're sort of tricky. We have identities on our diagonal, right? That's nice. How can we solve such a thing, right? How can we solve this thing? Basically, it's also typically, a, I mean, the off-diagonal Matrices are typically going to be dense. 
Our smooth matrices will typically be dense matrices. This is a tricky system of equations, so you could use something called a block gauss seidel method. What is a block gauss seidel method? So it's an iterative technique. So we assume that all our components of our, on our individual regular grids, that initially maybe they're all zero, right? And we want to solve for this one here, say. We just look at the first block line here, right? Then we get, okay, F1 equals the smooth S1 times Y. Okay, that's good. So we got one, right? Now what about the next one? So we look at the next equation and solve for this here. Now what we do, we take what we computed for F1 and put it in here, right? So we get S2 times F1. We subtract it from here, right? And all the others down here are still zero, so we get an equation for F2. Right? And then we know F1 and F2, so we, then we can compute the same way F3 until we go to the end. And now we have a sort of a first, itera a first sort of approximation for all the components. And then we start all over again and put the earlier computed values of these in here and solve for F1 again. And so for, for those of you who had the opportunity to, to see an elementary numerical analysis class, you might have heard of the gauss seidel method, which is exactly what I was talking about here, where the identities were maybe replaced by ones or numbers, and the S ones and so on were replaced by numbers too. This algorithm has a, has a name in statistics it's called the backfitting algorithm. So this is a, a classical technique and is a and, and one knows a little bit something about the uh, convergence properties for the case for the case of specific types of grids. So I think in the traditional statistical literature, the grid statisticians look at. At this point, I will argue a little bit <laughs> for the statisticians in the audience. Uh, in the classical generalized additive models, you look at grids corresponding to this line and this line here, and all the other ones are, are not in this model. Of course you could say, well, you know, but then statisticians, they know about interactions too. And, uh, you know, so that's where, where the other points come in as well. But the classical uh, work is on these, uh, just having these grid lines. So let's see, so let's go back again. Uh, So, okay, so we have, uh, we have sparse grids. We uh, saw that, you know, we, what we need to do, we need to, oh, I'm going the wrong way, huh? Sorry about that. <laughs> so here we are almost there, huh? Okay. And I mean, I mean, if you're interested in this, these methods, uh, I suggest you have a look at the, the book by Haste and Tipshirani for a first uh, go at this, and ask some references. So here's another way to look at this. Uh, again, you know, the, the backfitting algorithm is maybe a slightly more formal way. So remember, we have a, a regular grid G which corresponds to piecewise multilinear functions, VG. And the question, I was asked the questions, you know, I always take these, these piecewise linear functions, right? Can we do something else? Yes, we can. And in fact, you know, in the literature, I think in the early literature, people also thought about sparse grid spaces based on Fourier approximants as well. So yeah, you don't have to use piecewise linear functions. You can use other, other function, basis functions as well. Or you could use wavelets. That has been done as well. Um, and so uh, remember what we want to do. Our learning problem was to minimize this functional. And we get a relatively dense matrix for that, you know, the, uh, which is tricky to assemble. However, if F was from some regular grid, we would have a much simpler problem. So that's how, well, how we came on to this backfitting approach where we say, okay, Recall that our f is actually a sum of functions on our subgrids. And I'll use uh, which one? Let's see. 
The red one? <laughs> okay, let's see. This is now good, huh? I will use the red one. So our f equals a sum over our fj. j equals 1 to m, say, right? So we have this function on our regular grid. And then we say here in our optimization problem, corresponding to the Gauss side L, what we say that, OK, out of, we plug this here into this here. And we say we know all of these things except for one. And that one we compute by minimizing this here. Right? And then we have that, then we put, so initially we just assume that everything is zero. Right? Then uh, at the second stage, so we know one of those, we put that in to this sum here, and then we compute the second one, again minimizing this. This is exactly the same as the gauss side L algorithm. Right? And we sort of minimize them in term, or this is the same as this backfitting algorithm in, uh, in terms of the optimization problem, so we always compute just one component at once, which gives us a manageable problem, a small problem for a small regular grid. Where the function in this grid, if you have 100 variables, this function might actually only depend on two or three or four. Now you could say, why, why are we only looking at functions of so few variables, right? I think that's a very, very important question. It's a question I think which statisticians have thought about. And I, I did, you know, I, I spoke to a statistical audience, and Berwin was there, I think, of, uh, some time ago. And, uh, and you know, the, the suggestion was made there, it was made to me earlier, that, you know, you, the number of variables you, you choose in these functions here, which is the num corresponds to the number of interactions, is sort of limited because you don't have enough data, basically, to estimate higher order interactions. With one cautionary note, so, so that the, I think the, uh, the folklore is that you go, typically you go up to two variables, right? But the folklore is maybe you'll have to go up to five. But this co cautionary note was that there was an example where you had to go up to nine. So you know, it depends a little bit on your, on your example, and, and I, I don't know, I mean, you'll have to have pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, uh, bias or priors, pretty good priors, I think, to get such high order interactions right. So you have to know a lot about your underlying systems. Or you have to believe a lot. Right. Okay, so now let's go back again to the regular grid. So now the question is, can we do something more efficient? Can we do th something, something quicker? Uh, this, is, this is going to be the end of my talk. And uh, yes, we can actually do something, something slightly more efficient, and that's work which we're still working on now. Now let's go back to a very simple problem, just the problem of interpolation. So if we have interpolation on a regular grid, piecewise multilinear interpolation, that problem is solved very easily because the coefficients are just the function values which we want to interpolate. Right? So we have no, we don't need to solve anything. So this is what I mentioned was the Lagrange uh, uh, property. So here I say, okay, so here our, uh, and I call this Pn, this is our interpolant, it's just a linear combination of the function values of our grid points times the Bi's, our basis function and our regular grid. Now this is not the case for general grids, but it's certainly the case for regular grids. Now, what if we do an interpolant of an interpolant? Does that make sense? Well, we get back the same function again, right? If we interpolate, once again, you know, the function values on the grid, they haven't changed. So, uh, uh, we get the same thing. So, if we apply this interpolation operator Pn twice, we get Pn again. And now, the important property, which is not quite as trivial as this property here, is that if we do a sequence of two interpolations of two different regular grids, 
it doesn't matter in which sequence we do them. So if we interpolate on the one grid, and remember, I assume that our grids are always our, our binary grids. Right? So the size of the, the step length of, in all the dimensions is always uh, 2 to the minus L, say, if we're looking at the, the unit uh, hypercube. So we assume this property. So if we interpolate on the coarser grid, on one grid first and then on the other, we get the same as if we interpolate on the, the other grid first and on, then on this one here. And what, uh, uh, what do we get actually for this here? We get just the interpolant on the intersection of those two grids. Right. I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to prove this. You, you, can, you can see that's quite easily true in, in one dimension, right? Because, uh, you know, the interpolant on a finer grid and then on the coarser grid is the same as just the interpolant on the coarser grid, right? You don't need to worry about the finer grid. And then uh, on, in higher dimensions, the interpolation is just the ten, so-called tensor product. And I think uh, I'll spare you the tensor products of matrices. If you've seen those, fine. but uh, but uh, I mean, I mean, that's that's what basically what we what we use here. Uh, and this is what I what I said. So the so that's that's an important property. Now in this case, if we take our generalized sparse grid, so our generalized sparse grid is just the sum of our regular grids here. So here the regular grids are the uh, grid functions are the SI. And now, if we look at the uh, projection on the orthogonal complement, so what is the, you know, what is sort of the projection on the orthogonal complement? Well, what I mean here is just the identity, so the function minus the interpolant. It's basically just the error, in a sense, of your interpolant, right? So if you compute these errors of the error of the error and multiply those all out, Um, you find that this is uh, zero on your uh, sparse grid points. For, uh, I think for F being the interpolant on the, on the sparse grid points. So and, and you know and, and you do some algebra and basically what you have to do you have to multiply this out this this uh, and you use that these interpolants they all commute which we have before and at the end of the day what you get is that uh, sort of the the uh, interpolation on our sparse grid space is a linear combination of our interpolants on the subgrids. And these CIs, that, that you can actually get those from this, uh, from this thing here. And, and you can see, of course, because you have this product, you, know, you, they get, you get the binomial uh, uh, coefficients. And maybe some signs right in here, too. So, so some can be positive, some can be negative. But this is a nice thing. So if you want to compute an interpolant in our sparse grid space, we can just compute the interpolant in all the subspaces and take this combination here. Uh, to get the interpolant in the sparse grid space. This has been observed, I think, by Smolyak in 1963 as well. Very dense, short paper. He put lots of stuff in. But I think it has been, again, you know, uncovered and, and you know, formally proved and things like that, and further investigated since by a, a variety of people, starting, of course, in, in the school by Zenger and, and Griebel and his... Uh, Collaborators. So this is this is nice, but you know this is a result for interpolation. Of course, we don't want to do interpolation. We want to solve this minimization problem in sparse grids. Can we use a formula like this here to solve this problem? So what? What would, how would we sort of try to translate this into this world here? Well, we can't do interpolation, right? Because we don't know the values on our grid points. Because that's what we want to compute, basically. But uh, what 
what we uh, can do is we can fit to our subgrids this, uh, 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 this, we can minimize this functional. So we solve our problem, our optimization problem, on all of our regular subgrids. And we, we call this PIF, right? And then we take the linear combination of those. And this approximation, and then we get sort of some approximation. And the question is, you know, how does this relate to you know, the fit of the sparse grid, the minimization of the sparse grid, or the minimization of this here for the sparse grid space? Uh, you know, in, in the case of additive models, you have exactly the same question. You, know, you could say, well, I want to fit, do one-dimensional fits right, with all my variables. And what I would like to do is I would just like to combine them all right, in a linear combination and get my result at the end, our, my additive model. And this almost works, except for the two problems. We, if it, everything works well, what we can do, we actually uh, compute these additive fits. Say we have you know, d variables, so we have d variable fits, but we have to subtract d minus 1 times a constant, namely the, the mean, right? Because that mean value we sort of included in all our, our additive uh, components as well, so we have to subtract that. But, it, but that would exactly be this formula where one of these p's is actually a fit onto the constant space. So we can do that, and that formula works well in one case, and the property, and it's not surprising because that was the important property for our, for why the interpolation works, is that our projections onto those subspaces have to commute. Now the question is, when do these things commute, right? And that uh, commutation property can be shown to be very closely related to the independence of your variables. So maybe a bit uh, 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 roughly put, you know, if these variables are independent, we can use a combination technique for these, uh, for these uh, formulas. So, so that's the key here as well. So if the projections, if we solve our problem on one subspace, right, then sort of solve it again on a second subspace, right? And I'll, I'd have to, I mean, it's a bit slightly more tricky because what we actually have to solve, we have to solve the Galerkin equations. We can't just evaluate the function on the data points and solve the problem again. So it's slightly more complicated than that. But if we solve those Galerkin equations, uh, then we, if these things commute, then we get the, uh, uh, a formula like this here. In any case, this here gives us some sort of an approximation, a first approximation for our sparse grid fit. Then we could say, okay, this is the first approximation. Now what, what about, we just iterate this, right? We say that our exact function you know, is a first approximation plus something which we add on to it. And that thing which we add on, we again use a combination method to solve for the components again. So that's how we get a, a, an iteration. This type of iteration is a very very standard technique in numerical analysis, and it's called a, a, a iterative refinement technique. So that's when you have a sort of a somewhat imprecise way of solving a problem. You compute the solution, right? A first approximation, you subtract that, and you get an equation for the, for the error. Then you solve that again, approximately, right? And so on. So your approximate solver is also what is called a, a preconditioner for the underlying iterative technique. And you can use so-called uh, conjugate gradient uh, methods to speed these things up even further. So basically what I wanted to say is that this combination technique provides you with a way to, uh, to approximate uh, uh, and, and to, to develop iterative techniques. And that's basically where we're at in our research, uh, we're looking at trying to understand you know, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, approximation properties of these methods.
and you know how well these uh, techniques converge. Um, and you can you can you can relate a, a, a kernel. You can also get a kernel which relates to the combination technique. I think I'll I'll leave that out. And uh, uh, here's an example. Has anyone of you heard of the UCI data collection? Yes, yes. Some, huh? Right. Good. And the Boston housing data, huh? Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. And right, so here I have uh, uh, errors for three algorithms for a, a simple a sparse grid model. And you can see here, this here is a, uh, so these are so-called uh, additive Schwarz techniques. They're, they're sort of sim simpler iterative techniques. This here is our backfitting. So it's actually the best, if you could think, uh, if, you, if you look at this number of iterations. And here is the, if you use, uh, uh, well, sorry, this is the, using the, the, the standard uh, sparse grid methods. This here is actually using the, uh, the combination technique where the coefficients are actually chosen as well so that it converges better. So you can see this thing here doesn't converge quite as fast as the, the, the backfitting. The thing is that the backfitting technique has a dependency. And th that's a problem. So in order to compute your first component, for first you compute your first, and then once you have done that you can compute your second component and so on. So there's a so-called dependency. There's a you need to compute one before you do the other. In the combination technique, you can compute all your components in parallel, then combine them. So if you have a parallel method, even though the convergence might look to be slightly slower, it will be, on a parallel computer, this will be much substantially faster than the backfitting technique. And so I think this is the, my second last slide. So high dimensional functions are quite common in many applications, but they're not common if you look in, and I'm talking about my own community of numerical analysts, there's, there, you know, we're starting to wake up to this challenge for functions of many variables. And I think there are lots of challenges here, interesting challenges. If we use the ordinary grids, we numerical ana analysts love, you know, and are used to these piecewise multilinear functions or or other finite element type of procedures, they all suffer under the curse of dimensionality. So we have to use some new schemes, maybe based on hierarchical basis functions, sparse grids, to get a substantial reduction of our complexity. The, the nice thing at the end we saw with these combination techniques is that we actually can use our techniques we know for ordinary regular grids to build new sparse grid algorithms. Maybe just a, a last point. You could say, well, functions of many variables, why don't we just approximate those with neural, artificial neural nets? Good question. Why not? Um, to that I would say, you know, these are uh, the advantage of these types of function spaces, you know, is, is there certainly the linearity. We have linear function spaces. We don't suffer under the problem of multiple minima and things like that because of the function space, which you do in artificial neural nets. Um, and, uh, and also we have a very nice, I think, and well studied uh, uh, approximation theory for these uh, functions, where we know what type of functions are, are well approximated. So I think there are some advantages over maybe sometimes more standard techniques of approximation in, in uh, machine learning. So I think with that I'd like to end and, and ask if you have any questions. If not, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer questions at the barbecue. Okay, thank you.